Okay, uh, so <laughs> let's see what's been going on. Uh, pretty crazy times all around. I uh, was hoping that our next meeting would be able to be in person, but uh, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to do that. So uh, happy to, to start jumping onto the, the Zoom uh, virtual meetings here, uh, and hopefully we can get back to in-person meetings soon. Um, we're going to go ahead and skip, because we have so many people, uh, we're going to skip the, the, int the individual uh, personal introductions. Um, but I did want to start with uh, asking uh, if there's anyone out there looking for a job or that is hiring, uh, please go ahead and send uh, just a, a quick note in the chat. Uh, and then you're also uh, encouraged to uh, post that onto our LinkedIn page for the San Diego Tableau user group. Uh, I did post recently um, a dashboard that someone came up with. Um, and sorry, I forget the name off the top of my head, um, but it is a dashboard that lists available jobs and people that are looking for a job. So um, check that out on, on the LinkedIn page, um, the Tableau user group page, uh, and you can check out that dashboard and, and you can enter your information or post any jobs that you have available. Okay, cool. I see your, your message there, David Olson. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and just make a note of those names. And if I come across any jobs, I'll be happy to, to post those and send those out to individuals as well. Uh, if you want to go ahead and send me your, um, your CV, then I can also match those up uh, a little bit better based on experience and uh, the type of job it is. Okay, cool. I see that, uh, Charles, you just posted one on there. Uh, that's great to see. So, uh, you know, one of the big benefits of these meetings is is networking and collaboration. So um, I encourage everyone to, to try to help each other out with any opportunities that uh, you may know about, or, or if you're looking for something, uh, please take advantage of that as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce Stephen Skinner, who's our presenter today, our first presenter. Um, I met Stephen about a little over a year ago, I believe, uh, at one of our meetings here in San Diego. Um, and Stephen came to me with, a, with an interesting story. He had a career uh, as a, an IT manager um, and in, in some non-Tableau, non-data non visualization uh, background, uh, but he was looking to make the change into data visualization with a focus on Tableau. Um, and then I, I talked with Stephen at the, the Tableau user group last year uh, as well in uh, Las Vegas. Um, and he was telling me about his journey of just basically self, uh, self teaching through all of the amazing community resources out there and uh, Tableau's uh, tr training, online training, knowledge base and all that. Um, and I thought it was a really interesting story to see how someone just uh, basically came from nothing uh, built their skill set up over a relatively short amount of time um, and was was being so pro proactive on that. So I wanted to uh, to give Stephen the opportunity to tell a story uh, and um, we're going to find out about that today. And he's also going to talk about uh, design principles because he comes from a, a design background as well. Uh, so I'll go ahead and hand it off to you, Stephen. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt. Hello, everybody. It's really a, it, it's a big change to be uh, on this side of the, uh, the microphone, so to speak. Um, usually I'm in the audience uh, in Zoom. So uh, it's nice to see everybody. Um, welcome. Glad you could join us wherever you're, uh, you're coming from. Um, this year I've, I've attended quite a few tug meetings in different parts of the world um, virtually, and that's been interesting too. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and, um, uh, share my screen. I've got a slide deck I'm going to talk through and, uh, and we'll do, uh, we'll do Q and A, uh, uh, at the end of each session using the Q and A, um, icon at the bottom of your zoom window. So, uh, Matt and I are going to help moderate Q and A for each other, uh, as we go too. So I'm um, just going to go ahead and dive right in, share my screen. Uh, yeah, and I'll just mention it's, it's preferred to use the Q&A uh, as opposed to the chat. Good. Okay. All right. And 
Wait for it. There we go. Is that good, Matt? You see that? Yep, looks good. Looks full screen okay. on my side. And so I am. Uh, where am I? Uh, well, I'm in. Uh, I'm in um, uh, the Hillcrest Bankers Hill area of San Diego. So um, uh, okay, uh, let's dive right in. So and, and I'm going to talk about two things: um, my Tableau journey and design best practices. Uh, so this is a presentation in two parts, and uh, and we'll do Q and A at the end. So. I have had an interesting professional journey. I, I didn't know it was called a journey until I went to Tableau Conference a couple times and I realized, nope, I have to call this a journey. So, uh, and that is that I'm trained, I'm a native of Los Angeles, so a native Californian, um, uh, trained a, as an architect, not as a data architect, but as an architect who designs buildings. I went to UC Berkeley uh, back in the 20th century. And um, I've had kind of a, a unconventional career in that it's tended to follow my interests and for the most part I've been very lucky because I've been able to do things that that interest me and uh, that really has been my motivation um, after architecture uh, after graduating with an architecture degree I became very interested in 3d computer graphics which was not really a thing in architecture in the 80s um, and that led me to the computer graphics industry and visual effects in Hollywood, um, which took me to Silicon Valley, um, where I uh, got caught up in the dot-com uh, boom and bust cycle. And I had to reinvent myself uh, in 2002 because uh, all of the uh, tech jobs went away for a while at that time. And I moved into real estate technology because I realized that despite all the startups I'd worked for, the only way I actually made money changing jobs was when I would flip my own house. And having been an architect, I knew something about houses. I ended up selling houses for a few years, which I hated. Um, and, uh, and I moved into the technology side of the space, working as VP of technology and then later CIO for two of the largest um, residential brokers here in California. And along the way, companies like Trulia and Zillow came out and they started to introduce um, visualization tools into real estate. And that helped to really open up my eyes to uh, the possibilities for visualization. Uh, I learned, in fact, that you know, Tableau was really the go-to uh, platform for that. And in 2018, I left my job as CIO at First Team Real Estate in Orange County to focus on um, contracting for them, but also to focus on developing a visualization practice. I thought I was going to be a timeshare CIO and um, realized over the course of this year that my lane, my area of specialization was really around on the, on the visual side of, of, of data literacy and the ability to use tools like Tableau to, you know, to help solve problems visually. And so um, inspired by Valerie Logan of the Data Lodge, um, uh, came up with the term visual data architect. So that's what I call myself now. Um, I'm not a data scientist. I'm not an architect. I'm a visual data architect. My Tableau journey kind of parallels this. In 2018, I bit the bullet and spent a lot of my own money to go to TC 2018 in New Orleans. And so the theme there is, I hope this is worth it. And I was absolutely blown away by the enthusiasm and the global uh, community, I, I really, I was, I could not believe that I had never heard of this or been to one of these conferences before. And at that time I was still practicing in real estate and that industry was completely underrepresented. So TC 2018 was kind of a, a big eye opener. I spent part of that year, um, just sort of brute force teaching myself how to do visualization with real estate data. I knew what I wanted to do and I knew what was possible. I literally had no idea what I was doing. Um, but when I was done, I showed it to people and they were impressed, but I didn't know a dimension from a measure. I, I, you know, and yet I knew that I wanted to create heat mapped visualizations of real estate sales activity in Southern California. And I managed to do it. Um, and I also realized that 
I had to make a real commitment to learning this platform. Um, the, 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 the Tableau community and the data family community reminds me of what the computer graphics industry was like um, uh, 30 plus years ago when it was a small group of passionate people around the world, uh, creative, technical, and business people all coming together to, 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 to really, um, you know, uh, really create uh, an industry and a set of tools and, that didn't exist before. So um, fast forward to last year, uh, I went again to, to uh, TC 2019, signed up for a lot of training there and got on board with, the, uh, with Tableau's e-learning platform. The, uh, the, the desktop fundamentals that they teach at the conference, um, while it's useful, that uh, class was so oversubscribed that the network crashed. No one was a 900 people were not able to take any classes. And so Tableau gave everyone a year long subscription to e learning. And um, th that's coincided nicely with the pandemic. So, um, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of time on my hands to do things like this. Um, but I've also had to figure out where to focus my energy, uh, especially my my learning energy because it's a very broad, um, you know, a topic data visualization that covers um, so many different disciplines: creative, technical, coding, um, and, and I'll talk more about that in the design part. So um, along the way, I, I I was very impressed by the quality of some of the work that was shown at the Tableau conference. Um, especially this, the work related to social impact, uh, which is an area of personal interest to mine. And I volunteered and got involved with, the, uh, with visualization for social good also uh, as a, someone helping with leadership. And I, I think now I'm called an ambassador or a partner, which just means that I talk about them at times like this. However, being involved with Viz for Social Good also connected me to some really great people in, in around the world. Some of them people I would not otherwise have had a chance to get to know, like David Pyers and Neil Richards, you know, Chloe Tseng, who founded Viz for Social Good. And these are these are Tableau Zen masters, people who've won Iron Viz and and um, and have been very like everyone else in the community have been um, very encouraging uh, to people like myself who showed a, uh, you know, an ongoing interest. So again, fast forward to 2020, I'm, I'm practicing as a, uh, as a consultant and trying to develop my practice in this, in this area that I call visual data architecture. So just a quick little uh, uh, snapshot of how I got here because, and I'll try to tie it all together in a few minutes. Uh, in 1982, the computer, rev the personal computer revolution started. I saw these things in stores and I wanted one and I, or I wanted to use one at work and I couldn't do either. So I literally bought a Apple computer and I taught myself 3D, uh, the fundamentals of 3D computer graphics back when um, the image on the right was a real-time flight simulator program. Um, and, but fundamentals are fundamentals and I learned enough uh, at that time. Uh, I took some of my architectural drawings, I converted them to 3D by plotting all the points and putting in the numerical values and I managed to get a job interview at, at, a, at Digital Productions, a visual effects studio in Hollywood, uh, working on the film, The Last Starfighter and, and television commercials and scientific visualization. So I managed to make a leap from uh, you know, Apple computer uh, to supercomputer graphics and, and I never really looked back. Um, this company uh, afforded me an opportunity to work with uh, developers, uh, art directors, uh, creative and technical people, it was 100 people. We wrote all our own code um, based on a platform that was then called uh, Movie BYU, an open source plat uh, uh, 
3D rendering platform out of Brigham Young University. And we had uh, the world's fastest computer, which was, you know, which was great for bragging rights. And so I spent about five years there and it was a wonderful experience learning about the possibilities of computer graphics at an early time in the industry. And when we weren't doing work in visual effects, we would do, okay, here's a screen from, yeah, Last Starfighter. So again, photorealism, you know, 30 years ago, this was the state of the art in computer graphics. Everything was metal. Um, if you were lucky, you had transparency and shadows and maybe reflections, uh, but you certainly didn't have animated people or anything you know, like we see today. But the principles remain the same. And when we weren't doing computer graphics for the entertainment industry, we would lease out time on the Cray to do uh, supercomputer scientific visualization as a uh, national supercomputer access site, part of the National Science Foundation. And that those programs continue today uh, at here at UC San Diego, where they have a very extensive supercomputer center. So again, it was very interesting to me that, that uh, these technologies that powered flight simulation and so on could also be used for scientific visualization. And that really prompted my lifelong interest in visualization in particular. And I knew that it could be applied to real estate. Um, I'm not necessarily that interested in doing that today, but that ultimately is what led me to Tableau, was wanting to figure out how to apply some of these capabilities to the field I was in, uh, in real estate technology. And I, I don't need to tell anybody here that in the last you know, 10, 20, 30 years, the advancements in computing power and usability uh, are, have just really made it possible for anyone with a desktop computer and ability and understanding to, to be a citizen data scientist. That's another, another job title that I give myself sometimes. And uh, so these things have been part of my professional journey. Um, and a big part of that has been continuous learning, uh, having worked in the technology space and hired and interviewed a lot of people. Um, if you're going to stay in this field for your whole career, you, you, it's advisable to commit yourself to learning and staying current and those topics that are important to you. Um, at least that's what I did. And so um, some of the resources that helped me with that in relation to visualization were going to the conferences, the Tableau conferences, uh, participating in Tableau's e-learning platform, which is good uh, uh, if you can do self-directed study. However, getting connected to the global data fam on Twitter has also helped me to see what else is out there. And as I, because Twitter, as hopefully everybody knows, is a very popular channel for distributing uh, biz content from Tableau and other sources. And if you start paying attention to what's going on there, you will start to see who are the leaders and who are some of the leading organizations. And some of those organizations are listed here, Data Coach, vis Visualizing Data, Data Blick. These are all Data Viz Studios or Data Analytics slash BI practitioners around the world. And fortunately for us this year in response to COVID-19, most of these organizations are doing all kinds of ongoing uh, classes. It's another way of doing business development. And today, you can literally participate in free visualization classes from some of the leading uh, practitioners around the world on a daily basis. The hardest thing about it, I've found, is just figuring out which time zone you want to be in and whether you're willing to stay up late or get up early. I took part in a free class uh, this morning uh, from, uh, who was it, InfoLab in London. It was fantastic on uh, dashboards and, 
uh, intermediate level class on dashboard layout. It was fantastic. And because I'm self-taught, I'm aware of the things I don't know, try to be fairly open about them. And I also know that sometimes going into a group setting is an excellent way to, to step up your game because there's only so much you can do on your own uh, working at home. But uh, continuous learning is really key. Uh, uh, I mentioned on this list the Data Visualization Society. That's another great resource that's free to join. It was founded a year or two ago, and they have uh, north of 10,000 members today. And they publish a journal on Medium, and the journal is called Nightingale, and it, anyone can publish there. Most of the articles are short, but it is a great platform for seeing what people are doing in our space around the world. And Nightingale, the name of the journal is named after Florence Nightingale, the nurse who helped pioneer public health, but was during, I, I'm going to say the Crimean War a long time ago, but she was an early pioneer of data visualization as well because she took records, uh, kept records, and, and uh, created early traditional visualizations. Um, so that's where the name comes from. Along the way, I've also learned that certain parts of the world, uh, are certain, you know, there are certain viz centers around the world. Uh, very big in London, you know, and in the UK and in Europe. I had an opportunity to work in Europe doing animation for three and a half years. And, um, and I became very interested in what was then called inf infographics. And, you know, and that led to dashboards and that led us to where we are today. So a quick, a quick question, Stephen. Yeah. Um, someone, Michael Lane was asking, where was the, the class that you took on intermediate dashboards? Uh, the organization is called InfoLab. And I, I think what I'd be happy to do as a follow-up to our session today, Matt, is to put together a one sheet of uh, resource links that we could, you could distribute to everybody here or we could post for sharing. Fantastic, thanks. Yeah, so that was at InfoLab. But all of these organizations are offering free, um, free training. And you can only watch so many Tableau self-guided videos before you really want to be in a class with some other people you can relate to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have another question, but I'll hold it until you get to your, um, your design slide. All right. So along the way, you know, some of my personal challenges have been that I'm not a data scientist. I don't, you know, I wish I was because I like to do, you know, I like to learn things, but I, I don't write code. And frankly, uh, math is not my strong point. That's why Matt and I have become friends. He's the math guy. But um, uh, so those have been challenges and, and they have also, recognizing those challenges have helped me understand where to focus my, my practice. And my practice area being technical and creative, but really focused on the visual analytics side of it in partnership with the data science side of it as well. I'm having worked in technology my whole career, I've always worked at organizations where software development was a part of what we did, either in-house or with, with third parties. And uh, so it's not that I'm uh, not comfortable in that space, but when push comes to shove, I'm not the person who's going to write the code, even if I know what it needs to do or have a, have a good idea. Uh, another challenge when you're self-employed as a consultant or a contractor is self-promotion. You have to market yourself and you need to get the word out there that, that you are in this field and this is these are the services that you offer. And if you don't do that, people won't know that you're available. And along with that comes you know, the challenge of being confident about your abilities and that you're making good choices about what you're spending your time on and that you can actually uh, do this work and help people uh, along the way. And last but not least, of course, you know, money, time are all factors in this. And also, um, you know, will acceptance, will, will um, you know, uh, do I belong here? 
And fortunately for uh, our community and the, the, the global data visualization community, that's really not an issue. The, the willingness of everyone globally to help lift other people up has been pretty astounding. And if anything, I personally have not taken enough advantage of that. I started out this year doing makeover Mondays and workout Wednesdays, and I realized that that was chewing up all my time. Uh, and sometimes I needed help, and I didn't know that I could reach out literally to people I don't know on Twitter uh, that, are, that are part of the Tableau data family, and, and people would help me just like they've helped others around the world simply in the interest of uh, you know uh, a rising tide lifts all boats so that's been um, that's been very informative and one of my goals for the second half of this year is to participate more in that community and to reach out for help there are some programs that I didn't include here but th that Tableau and, and the Tableau community are promoting right now around mentoring, signing up to be a mentor or a mentee. I don't know if you've seen that, Matt, but there's, there's a lot going on this year in trying to, uh, you know, to match up uh, uh, skilled practitioners with people at all levels so that everyone can, can learn along the way. Yeah, and I'll just mention that's, that's always been a goal of the user group or an aim of the user group as well, that, uh, we try to have content for everybody because what I find is that uh, we have a lot of people that come to the meetings year after year and are very experienced, but every single meeting, I would say either easily half of the people have just started with Tableau or haven't even used it yet and are just getting interested in it. So there's always that, uh, that set of new users. So we're going to try to keep the content uh, something available for everyone. Yeah. So uh, in this first part of my presentation, this is my last slide and my message is act on your dreams. Uh, kudos to uh, Ed Ruscha, the fine artist, that this is one of his paintings. Uh, that was then, this is now. And that, that is really, uh, that's the takeaway from uh, this part of, you know, this overview of my, my own journey. Um, it's non-traditional and sometimes that's hard for me to explain to employers, but uh, I know that I, the, these, these steps along this path have in many ways all been interrelated, even if I didn't plan it that way in the beginning. So, so, so much for part one. Matt, should I keep going? Do we want to do any Q and A uh, right now? Yeah, well, and I, we have a question out about, um, specifically about design, which I know you're going to talk about now. Yes. So um, I don't see anything else. I think we can just go ahead and, Okay, so this is the part of the presentation where I talk about design best practices and my, my, uh, uh, my startup practice in visual data architecture. And I, I refer to visual data architecture as the space where design thinking and data analytics meet to help people see and understand data. I'm sure you'll recognize the phrase, see it, help people see and understand data. That's Tableau speak. And um, I don't need to explain data analytics, but design thinking, you can Google it. Design thinking is a thing. It is a discipline and an approach that's very popular right now uh, for solving uh, business problems in particular. And one thing they say about architecture, when you're in architecture school, you don't get paid very much. I literally made more money in high school than I did as a graduate architect from Berkeley. But they, architecture, the saying is, um, it's good training for doing other things. And I'm, I'm a good example of that because it teaches you about uh, creative and technical problem solving and provides you with a process and a framework to do that. And it's an iterative process and that can result in a building, but it can also result in a solution. And so for what we're talking about, it's really a solution. And because I'm practicing in this space, I'm trying to tie it all together with my background. This, uh, the illustration on the left is by a man named Hugh Ferris in the 1930s. He did a lot of futuristic renderings with you know, charcoal and, and uh, they kind of speak to the, the mystery of, of things and buildings and structure and so on. So 
agenda, design best practices. We've talked about my Tableau journey. So first of all, trending now, uh, the I Iron Viz competition uh, submittals for, the, for judging the first round just wrapped up this week. There were 370 entries in the category of health and wellness. And if you have not seen any of these, it's worth looking at them. And you can find them uh, through Twitter under, I believe, the hashtag IronViz. And it's fascinating to see what around the world, what kind of choices people have made, creative and technical, to tell a story around health and wellness. Um, and again, it's a great source of design inspiration as well. You'll see people have taken very different approaches. And the way Iron Viz works is this is the first round. You know, uh, finalists will be selected from this and they will compete uh, later in the year in the actual competition. I understand that the 370 entries is a significant multiple from any previous year at least 4x so it speaks to the growth of the you know competency and skills and motivation of people around the world as well and, and that's been fun to watch uh, another thing two other things that are trending now uh, complexity it seems like it's part of iron viz and some people's goals in Tableau, which you'll see in Tableau Public, is to make really complicated dashboards. And, you know, they're not just complicated, they're, they represent a visual expression of some incredible technical achievements as well. Uh, and yet, if you look at the types of things people are creating, uh, complexity is clearly a trend and partly driven by the, the availability of data from you know, so many sources now. And a newer trend that has just emerged is the long form viz or, you know, dashboards go portrait mode uh, in, in a nutshell. And it'll be interesting to watch that. Someone published an article this week, our dash, oh, it was a different article, but you're seeing more and more of these long form viz uh, projects where the, the uh, viz layout and resolution are, are, are structured much like web pages are and websites are now for a vertical uh, uh, portrait orientation as opposed to the more traditional uh, landscape orientation. So, yeah, I think that's a good good technique when you're telling a story. I've seen some really yeah. good use of that. Yeah. Now, you know, really what we're talking about is visual communications, and I've learned, I made a quick list of some of the some of the bins that that might fall into. You have information design, a ton of work in the area of data journalism, quite a bit of it making into newspaper, into the media these days in response to COVID-19. You have pure storytelling, you know, more traditional data viz and scientific viz, and of course, um, you know, BI as well. Uh, everywhere I've ever worked, BI meant, you know, a stack of, uh, of printed out Excel reports that the CFO looked at once a month, but I'm happy to be leaving that world behind. The illustration here is from Lovelytics. They're a firm back east that does a lot of BI work and they've published quite a few, I'll call them open source templates uh, for business uh, this year that are really worth looking at as well. I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit, Matt, so we can get to stay in our time frame. So talking about design fundamentals, um, this is really a wide open topic. However, when you're working on your own projects as well as, you know, uh, enterprise projects, corporate projects, it's important to think about branding, the branding of the work and the branding of the company you're doing the work for. Design basics is a really wide open description for everything from everything that's on this page. Composition, execution, best practices, and there are trends, and there is no one trend in a field, you know, in a creative field in particular. Um, color theory is especially relevant to what we're doing, uh, where we are designing for a user experience, and not only can a skillful use of color theory help improve the work, but it can also 
be used for accessibility when you're designing for people who may, um, I, we don't call it colorblindness anymore, but I don't know the other term, may have difficulty in perceiving certain colors. Um, color theory is a topic that you'll find on uh, publications such as Nightingale as well. There is, There are people in our viz community, apologies for the noise, uh, who, who work and have written and, and studied this extensively, uh, color theory for visualization. One of the areas that's of great interest to me and I struggle with a little bit is in the, is in the, the more freeform side of the design process, you know, conceptualization um, and uh, sketching and wireframing uh, visualizations before you get into the actual construction of the sheets and dashboards. It's very easy to jump right into Tableau and think you can figure things out there, but just like any creative and technical project, some effort spent on storyboarding will really help you. Uh, and I've taken classes uh, with Andy Kirk in the UK and, and others where they really emphasize the importance of sketching uh, with pen and paper before you put uh, mouse and keyboard you know, to work on Tableau. It's a, it's a different way of problem solving and uh, something that I, even though I know how to do that, uh, I struggle with that a little bit as well. And then last but not least, uh, one thing you'll learn early on if you study design is that designers, especially graphic designers tend to work off of a grid. A grid is a system like graph paper where you can create a visual hierarchy and it will add structure to your work. You can look at people's uh, dashboards and vizs and you can see where they have used that, where they have not. Now, you know, you can, a grid is an important tool. I built a grid in Google Slides for doing this presentation as an exercise. And I've tried to follow it. Just as you can work with a grid, you can choose to ignore it and break those rules too. But in order, often when you break the rules, it's, it's good to know why you're breaking them and what they are rather than just sort of taking a collage approach to your work. Uh, using a grid, a layout grid, a, a, a hierarchical grid will help you add structure and visual hierarchy to your work. And another thing that I've learned along the way, and you'll see this when you look at the more sophisticated visualizations, here's a good example, is that backgrounds are an important tool for creating dashboards. In this example from Lovelytics, all of these uh, uh, dashboard panes with rounded corners and drop shadows, uh, you can't do that in Tableau. So those were created in another, in another platform called Figma and imported as a background and the viz was laid over it. It's actually pretty easy as long as you don't get caught up in the challenges of working with floating um, objects on your dashboard. Um, I mentioned that design is a process. Uh, it's important if you can to involve your customer in that and to have some type of a workflow that you've envisioned for prototyping where you work from simple to complex. In this example, from paper prototypes to user testing on paper, maybe some low fidelity wireframe type of prototype, another round of user testing before you get into the actual dashboard creation. Now, again, these are all guidelines. I, I'd be the first one to admit that, you know, not everyone follows these processes, myself included. However, the more you can structure your workflow to a process like this, it makes, it gives you a framework to talk to your clients and also to manage your own process so that you get from beginning to end with a known process and achievable results and, uh, and interaction and approvals from your customer along the way. Nothing worse than building something finishing it, showing it to someone, and then saying, that's not what I wanted. Well, if you work through an iterative process and you get approvals and feedback along the way, you can shield yourself from some of that, shall we say. Okay. And then um, starting to wrap it up here, some of the components of design. Oh, I actually, there's a little bit of repetition here. Actually, this, this is a repeated slide. So sorry about that. Um, let's go to resources. Just a quick overview of some of the resources that I've come across. Uh, 
I'm a big fan of uh, what's called the Swiss type typographic style. You can look it up. There's tons of practitioners of it. It comes out of the Bauhaus and early 20th century, you know, modern designers. Um, there, however, there is a designer, Massimo Vignelli, uh, quite well known, who's published uh, a book that is free. It's called a Canon, you know, and not Canon like C-A-N-N-O-N, but C-A-N-O-N. If you Google that, you can download it and you can learn about some of these design techniques about using a grid and how to create a hierarchy and so on. Um, the visual display of quantitative information has been around for decades. It's one of those books that you want to have on your office bookcase and you want to read some of it, uh, maybe all of it. I'm, I'm still not sure. I've literally had that book for decades before I knew what I was going to do with it in the 21st century. And then uh, I have, however, found that the big book of dashboards is a great reference um, I, yeah, where it's great hard copy reference of how biz designers have solved different business problems and, and, and why. A few other resources. I mentioned uh, backgrounds. Uh, Figma, figma.com is a uh, online platform for uh, doing uh, uh, wireframing, collaborative wireframing, and can also be used to create layouts and backgrounds. Most of the really visually strong vizs that you'll see use some type of icons from another source. There are a few icons built into Tableau, but, but uh, the Noun Project is an example of a, a free resource for icons. You just have to give them attribution. And if you haven't experimented with using at icons in your viz, in your dashboard, you'll be amazed at the, um, uh, the improvement you get from doing that. And Tableau supports the use of images and, and icons in, in your dashboards as well. And stock photography is related to icons uh, in that you'll see many of the sophisticated visualizations in submissions like IronViz include photographic imagery as backgrounds and things like that. And they're typically coming from stock photographic sources like iStock Photo or Shutterstock, Getty, etc. Those stock photos can get expensive, but they also represent a great way to add more visual punch to your presentation. Um, wrapping it up here, um, I talked about some of this. I've really learned by looking at uh, Viz authors participating in the data fam and also looking at some of the organizations that are providing free uh, training, coaching, and examples of their work. And I also get inspiration from the world of art and design outside of, of uh, Tableau in particular. And uh, I guess that's my last slide. So let's do Q&A and I'll turn it over to you, Matt. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for that, Stephen. Uh -huh. um, we, have, we have some, some questions about um, the design aspects. Uh, the first question was just, what is typography? What is typography? Well, uh, ty that's a great question. Typography refers to um, the work of um, uh, working with, uh, with, with letters, uh, with type. Um, once upon a time, in order to make a printed page, you had to take a piece of lead and smear ink on it and smash it up against a piece of paper. Typography refers to all of that work that you do with type, with words and letters and layout. And uh, it is fonts, thank you. Um, it's supported, you know, there's some typographic tools in Tableau, but sometimes the better resources are outside of Tableau in programs like uh, Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, and so on. Tableau has limited controls for controlling the spacing between words and letters and things um, like that. So that is the answer. In fact, I will show, this is an example of typography, right? Um, so next question. Um, no, I, I wanted to mention that, um, I'm not sure if it's still the case, I think it is, but 
uh, there are certain fonts that Tableau comes with, but if you paste a font that Tableau doesn't support into one of the dialogues, like a text dialogue, it will render that as well as I believe other formatting that's not native, it's not supported in the, in the uh, choices that are supplied there. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that's still the case. Someone could check that. Where, but where Tableau, that's it's good. You could use PowerPoint or, or Word or something yeah. or wherever else you can get other fonts. Yeah, and and where Tableau is not great is controlling the spacing between letters and words and lines of text and uh, graphic designer typography is what graphic designers practice and graphic designers pay a lot of attention to that as well. Um, I can see the Q and A now too, Matt. So yeah, feel free to filter them. But I see Michael Lane says, as a designer, what tools do you use? Um, so for planning, and I'm trying to do a lot of my planning, you know, through sketching and use tools like Figma to do wireframes, uh, and then use other tools like photo, more traditional graphic. Uh, computer graphic or graphic design tools like Photoshop, Illustrator, and so on. Um, Matt, do you want me to go down these questions? Uh, you yeah, to I'll, I'll ask the next one. What, what uh, Michael Lane asked, what reasons are there to break the grid rules? Yeah, well, they, actually, so since, since uh, I'm on this slide, uh, asymmetry would be a great reason or uh, uh, in order to give in emphasis to something. And so there's, you know, there's examples of um, breaking the rules or using your grid to do certain things. So in this example of this illustration, you know, this is a layout that has one, two, three, four columns. And um, it, they're not, you know, a grid is not unlike using containers when you set up a dashboard, in fact, or you could have a grid that you lay out your containers to follow. But, uh, uh, emphasis would be a reason to to break the grid, and and um, you know, you can find great resources to learn about this online. I'd say half the designers on the planet have probably made YouTube videos about any one of the things we're talking about. You know, and and, and I know that because you know I had to research a lot of this just to make my presentation. Sure. Uh, where did you get this one for the grid system? Uh, it's something that I saw in a Google search, um, and I'll, I'll publish that. I'll, I'll, I'll include that in my kind of resource cheat sheet that we'll, we'll okay. send out to everybody. Excellent. Yeah, I see a grid yeah. calculator and some. Yeah, uh, I have some from somebody's blog, course. but I, you know, honestly, I picked that one because it it worked with the. Uh, it spoke, you know, um, I'm well, I'm using Helvetica exclusively in this, and it it spoke to the way I was kind of laying out my slides. So. Cool. Um, the font for, the, for those of you who may be wondering. And uh, I wanted to point out that, that Charles Sutton put in a few links uh, for some color scheme sites mm -hmm. that people can use. Um, and, and Charles also mentioned, remember people don't consume information beyond one scroll, so don't make it too long for the, uh, for the vertical long form. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a great point. Um, so one more, uh, what's your take on complexity in practical data visualization? My take's complexity tends to be a detractor in business settings and simplicity rules. Thoughts? And I think that comes from Robbie Gerber and his team. Well, yeah, it's a great question. You know, I mean, I, I have to admit, I'm really drawn to these really complicated presentations. Some of, you know, I was a, lifelong reader of science fiction and National Geographic, and I used to collect all their maps and somehow all of, so there's a part of my own, you know, I think complexity is, well, I would say that personally, I think simplicity is better, but it's hard to present, you know, the real art is when you can take a complex topic and, and do a simple presentation of it. And so I, I think like in the example of the iron vis submissions, people are just throwing everything onto the page. Like, Hey, I, I, I look at all, look at it, what I can do. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to present the information, but um, uh, you know, we all have our own styles, but given that, so I, I come, you know, I've worked in the enterprise in the corporate environment. 
where um, visualization is not well understood by people over 40 and I'm 61. So it's um, complexity doesn't help with that, right? Yeah. And you're talking to a CFO, I seem to have some heavenly light coming down on my head. So it must, my time must almost be up. Um, when you're talking to a CFO who's used to working in Excel, you know, showing them a complex dashboard is not going to help you uh, get that, not going to help convince them that they should try this. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think there's, uh, there are a lot of factors there. If it's internal facing versus external facing, you know, if, if this is going to be a poster somewhere or somewhere on your website, then you need a certain level of polish. Uh, if this is just for decision making within an organization, uh, then obviously that's not quite as important. Uh, as a consultant, companies aren't quite as willing to pay me to put all the the splash and and all that stuff on it. They really just want to get onto the next data set and the next numbers. And I'm more than happy to to keep things simple and just move on to the the real actionable stuff. Um, but I really am also blown away by these kind of things, um, and I, I spent a lot of time looking at them and. Uh, at the last Tableau conference where they had about 40 or 50 of these up on the walls and uh, just really just amazed at what people can do. Well, that's that. And that's how I ended up being involved with uh, visualization for social good. I was looking at the gallery of all the posters and I, I was like, I want to, I want to be a part of that. And now I've kind of come around to like, well, I, I want to appreciate that, but I don't necessarily have to spend all my waking hours doing it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and Charles uh, mentioned um, another good point that he yeah. uses a whiteboard for, for wireframing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of great comments here. And, you know, I'm happy to follow up with anybody, you know, offline and talk more. Um, we're all connected. Uh, you know, I'm on uh, LinkedIn and, 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 and Twitter and all that. And, uh, and I'll be happy to put to take uh, uh, pull out some resource links from my presentation that, that uh, Matt, you can help me distribute and share with everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Someone asked, what's your contact information? Um, and I'll just direct them to... Uh, I'll just the, type it in here if that's okay. Uh, or, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll put, or we'll, you can put, post your slides and um, any other info to the, the LinkedIn Tableau user group page. So whoever's the anonymous attendee that asked that, um, you can find that on the LinkedIn channel. Yeah, and I would just say one last thing. And, you know, as part of all this, you know, I, I knew I had to have a catchy, you know, handle for, for what I was going to be. And because everybody's data, somebody on Twitter and there's, there's millennials and data, which I don't, I don't fall into that category. And then there's the millennial data analyst. I thought maybe I'd be the boomer data analyst, but I didn't want to date myself. So, um, you know, I registered a domain name that relates to my practice and visual data architecture and that's data builder b-i-l-d-e-r builder builder is picture in german and uh so it's a sort of a play on words connecting you know uh data and and picture and visualization and so that's my that's my stealth twitter handle that i'm going to reveal uh later this year when i get my act together so all right nice I'm done let me okay. out let me off the stage. Thank you, everybody. I hope Thanks, this was useful. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thanks for your time. You um, and, you know, I, I think on the agenda, I put that we'd take a five-minute break, but uh, it's only a two-hour meeting, so I'll just jump right in. Uh, and I got quite a bit of material as well. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, can everybody see it? Okay, uh, so what I'm gonna talk, to, talk about today is uh, the economy, which uh, unfortunately is, uh, is some really scary stuff right now. Um, and I'll just start with uh, sort of before, before COVID, what, what the macro picture looked like. Um, you can see GDP and unemployment rate here. Um, and I've got some uh, some dates marked out here uh, to see what the effect was. You can see that uh, Black Friday, which is a huge drop in the stock market, um, really didn't affect GDP uh, much in the long run. Um, even 9/11, you know, uh, doesn't doesn't affect it much in the long run. 
deleveraging in the housing market in 2008, where all of the, uh, the bad loans were, were bundled up and, and uh, allowed to go bad, they uh, really had a, a significant drop in GDP, but um, in the long run, things picked up and recovered nicely and, and kept going up. Um, it did cause uh, quite a bit of rise in unemployment at the time, up, in, up to about 10% or so. Um, which has slowly been uh, reducing and uh, to about 4% or so uh, pre-COVID. Um, just looking at, at the some monetary policy here, uh, the Federal Reserve balance sheet, um, the Federal Reserve started buying up uh, treasuries and uh, mortgage-backed securities and bad loans, basically stuff that was never going to get paid back. Um, and you can see that their, the balance sheet exploded quite a bit in that 2008 era uh, and has slowly, ri slowly risen uh, as, as the policy of quantitative easing, easing has uh, been implemented and a huge peak until um, at some point um, they stopped buying, buying all that stuff up and they were sitting at about $4 trillion. So this is millions of dollars. This is $4 million million. So that was about $4 trillion in assets on the balance sheet at the time. And the federal funds rate, uh, which is the interbank uh, lending rate that's set by the Federal Reserve, um, is a way that, that the Federal Reserve tries to control inflation and unemployment, and uh, which is the dual mandate of the Federal Reserve, the stated purpose of the Federal Reserve. Um, and you could see that they had lowered interest rates to basically zero to uh, stimulate the economy, to try to keep more money in the economy, keep people spending. And they'd slowly been ramping that up um, before uh, COVID hits. Uh, this is also pre-COVID. So this is uh, looking at the total savings deposits held at the Federal Reserve banks. Uh, and this is basically all of the commercial banks in the United States, uh, probably around the world, and they deb deposit uh, money into the Federal Reserve banks. And um, I'm sorry, these are savings, uh, not at the Federal Reserve, but at the banks themselves. Sorry, these are at the depository institutions. So these are savings at the banks themselves, so basically passport style checking and savings accounts. And uh, that was at $9.8 thousand billion dollars, so $10 trillion uh, in, in savings, uh, all ba commercial banks, or at all uh, depository institutions, commercial banks, and also savings and loans and other things. Um, and this is mostly what the public interacts with. So it's about $8.4 trillion stored there. And I should mention too, all this data comes from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Uh, which was retrieved from their FRED system, what's called the FRED uh, Federal Reserve Economic Data uh, using the, the FRED API. And this is all available uh, uh, to, for free to anyone. <clears throat> Looking at wages, uh, I've got two lines here. This is all employees and non-supervisory employees. So wages to include uh, managers basically. Uh, and you can see I have them uh, ranked here by by the amount. So information uh, IT was at the top uh, with average earnings of $1,562 a week uh, and then mining and logging construction. But uh, what I want to show is that these wages are basically going up um, fairly consistently there. Uh, there's a little bit of variation here in construction. I think that may be seasonal. Uh, this is seasonally adjusted. Uh, let's see. All employees. This one's not seasonally adjusted. So yeah, that's why you see a little bit of a uh, little bouncing in here. Uh, fast forward to COVID era. And we can see here already a huge drop in GDP. Um, move this camera thing. So GDP went from 22, almost $22 trillion uh, down to 19.4 uh, in Q2. Uh, and the unemployment rate spiking obviously as well. Um, and, you know, as, as part of a normal economic cycle, um, you expect the unemployment to, to rise and fall. 
uh, you expect some variability in there, um, and that's part of a normal cycle, especially on the debt side with with uh, inflation, more more debt, more money in the system, more people borrowing, more people spending, uh, inflation rises, and um, that can lead to cycles. But this obviously is ca not caused by a normal cycle uh, or people defaulting on debts. This is just caused by literally a reduction in, in production uh, from everybody having to, to stop what they're doing all of a sudden and, and stay home and uh, companies uh, losing all of their sales and, and having to scale back and things. Um, and you can also see that the, the Federal Reserve uh, balance sheet has now jumped up to uh, $7 trillion. So another $3 trillion basically in a very short amount of time. Um, and you can see here from the, the history of the federal funds rate that uh, when we had the, the housing market problem in 2008, uh, they had lowered rates, but they had slowly started trying to put a little bit of, little bit of a tamper on the, a little bit of a damper on the economy um, slow things down to prevent inflation, uh, and they had started to raise that federal funds rate. Basically, uh, this encourages banks to store money. It encourages people to store money in banks so that they can get a higher uh, interest rate return, uh, which takes money out of the economy and slows things down a little bit so that we don't get bubbles again like we did before, uh, whether it's in housing or the stock market or anything else. Um, and of course, they had to just drop that rate, and they dropped it to zero. Uh, basically, to just completely free up credit, no, uh, no restrictions whatsoever in there, um, and I believe it's still at zero. I think it maybe at zero point two five percent right now. And on the uh, amount of savings in banks, you can see there was also a huge ramp up too in the amount of money that's stored in commercial banks. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what causes this, but. Um, if I had to guess, I would say a lot of people had to move to cash uh, in order to uh, and sell some of their other assets um, in order to uh, provide a safety net while uh, things recover. Uh, and so far, it hasn't been a whole lot of difference. Um, hasn't been a whole lot of effect um, on wages in some sectors. Uh, but construction in particular, uh, there was, it was a significant drop, which has recovered since. Um, and then it's some, some as well, leisure and hospitality, uh, which has not recovered much. Um, and that's uh, uh, obviously because uh, people aren't flying, people aren't staying in hotels, things like that. Uh, so one of the, the big issues that come up, came up with uh, the, supply chain uh, and the reliance on the supply chain for so many things from China. So you, you might've heard of, uh, you know, we're decoupling from China and uh, they're, they're basically gonna try to find other places to source different things. Well, that's, that's kind of true, um, but you're not gonna pass up an opportunity to buy something when someone's offering it cheap. Um, and especially when you have limited amount of money to spend, uh, which is everything's tight right now. Um, so really what, they're moving to is what they call China plus one. And this is nothing new. This was uh, actually this article is from July, 2019. So China plus one basically just means uh, having an, an alternative to uh, products that, that we would normally buy from China um, as it relates to healthcare and other uh, uh, critical, critical needs. So starting to look at, at some of the effect on the economy. So this is, a chart showing the airlines. Uh, this is load factor, which is one of the primary uh, KPIs of the airline industry. Uh, basically, it's the percent of available seats filled. Um, it's very seasonal, and um, you can see it just fell off a cliff. So uh, they were uh, in the summertime. It's up here on the high high side. You know, 87 percent, 80 plus percent, almost 90 percent. Um, but right now, and this the latest number I have is from April. Um, so it's, it'd be interesting to see how this is recovering, although I think everyone knows there's not a whole lot of recovery in the, in the airline industry right now. No, no one's jumping on planes voluntarily unless they have to. Um, and so it was at 13.8% the last time this monthly figure came out. Uh, air revenue passenger miles. So when you're looking at the, 
<laughs> the U.S. economy, uh, you start to look at some some really crazy numbers. Um, so this is uh, 90 million thousands. Uh, so just in February, 90 billion passenger miles uh, were flown just in U.S. carriers, uh, and that went down from 90 billion uh, to 4 billion. Uh, and then looking at the airline industry, uh, basically these are new orders for airlines and airline parts. Uh, looking at February, this was 9,000 million, so $9 billion just in February, uh, which dropped off. And now it was, uh, I'm not sure why there's a negative number here. This may have something to do with the uh, loss of orders that were supposed to happen or something like that. Um, and I did double check these numbers. It is actually listed as negative $16 billion. Um, obviously, you can't have a negative value of new orders. So there's something that goes on, but uh, it follows the general trend of falling off a cliff. Uh, and there was uh, at least some recovery there. That looks like it fell back down again in June. So looking at hotels, hotel industry is, is obviously one of the hardest hit by far. Um, and this is another enormous industry. Uh, so just looking at New York, for instance, this is the daily hotel revenue from rooms in the top 25 cities. Uh, this data comes from Smith Travel Research. And uh, just looking last year at um, New York City on a fairly typical July day was about $30 million a day. Every single day, $30 million was coming in just from rooms. That doesn't include the hotels, any of the ancillary services, uh, restaurants that are nearby in the area, et cetera. Uh, and that went from 30 million a day to two and a half million a day with a tiny recovery and then uh, falling off. This data is fairly, fairly recent. This is weekly data. <clears throat> so you can start to see the, the enormity here of, of uh, the losses if you think about you're losing $30 million every single day, and this has been going on for four months, plus uh, with no real end in sight. Um, you're talking about some serious money there. Uh, so looking at here, this is for the entire U.S. Actually, this is a county, uh, San Diego. So this is for the entire U.S. Um, typical July day, these are weekends here, so let's look at a weekend, $650 million just on July 27. So. 600 plus million dollars every single day, typically from the hotel industry. That dropped to about 80 million, 60 million across the entire country, um, and now has, has risen. Now we're at 335 million. So from 650 million to 335 million dollars, basically this industry is losing over 300 million dollars every single day just in rooms. Uh, just to switch over to California real quick, California making 90 plus million dollars a day and now $40 million a day. So one thing to consider with this as well is that uh, there are a number of taxes that are tap tacked onto every single hotel room. So you can imagine what the effect of this is on, on state and local tax revenues with uh, the hotel rooms and again, the restaurants and everything else that goes along with that. So uh, there's uh, gonna be a big, big tax uh, income problem. So one other thing that's coming out uh, is, or one effect of this is that uh, airlines are retiring their fleets. Uh, so this is American Airlines press release and they have uh, retired all their Airbus A330-300s, 757-200s, so quite a few planes uh, basically that were just retired early. and British Airways retired their entire 747 fleet. Um, there's also obviously the maintenance contracts and everything else that goes on with, with maintaining these machines. So uh, there's, there's quite a <clears throat> trickle effect uh, from all of this. <clears throat> Virgin Airlines on March 17th, 
uh, put out a press release saying that the uh, aviation industry is facing un unprecedented pressure and they're appealing to the government for uh, credit facilities to keep them afloat. Now this was March 17th when uh, probably a lot of people thought this may not take too long, uh, may be back up on our feet in two or three months, um, not understanding necessarily to the, you know, the worldwide, uh, continued worldwide scope of all of this. Um, and uh, they <clears throat> actually just saw, uh, filed for bankruptcy. Uh, on July 14th, they put out this press release saying that they're going to um, basically restructure their debt and uh, file for bankruptcy. And they just filed for bankruptcy a couple of days ago. So the oil market uh, is another that's been hit. Um, and there are a tremendous number of, of businesses and services that, that go along with the oil market uh, in the supporting role. Um, and uh, these are prices in uh, Oklahoma, WTI crude oil and Brent crude oil in Europe. Um, and prices actually went negative, uh, negative $37 a barrel um, on uh, April 20th. And um, that's basically because no one was available to buy the oil, um, everything shut down. So oil is still coming in on all the tankers and uh, there's no one there to buy it. Um, So uh, I'll just I'll just answer this real quick question. Uh, someone asked about the Federal Reserve assets, the upper blue curve. So uh, the Federal Reserve is a system of banks, and just like any bank, they can buy things and they can buy uh, they they buy bonds uh, and T bills from the, the U.S. Treasury uh, to uh, finance the U.S. government, uh, and then they also buy uh, distressed loans and uh, and. 2008, they bought a lot of mortgage-backed securities, uh, basically mortgages that were, uh, in many cases, uh, never going to get paid back, especially when housing prices dropped and a lot of unemployment unemployment spiked. Um, so the the blue line was their balance sheet, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, uh, and that's basically just all the assets on their balance sheet. So they are sitting with seven trillion dollars in uh, bonds and bad loans and other things. Uh, and, you know, the, the idea is that they can eventually sell them back to the market, uh, but the, these are not compet any more competitive than any other bonds out there or anything else. So um, it's basically just a repository. Uh, the crude oil ETF volatility. So um, yeah, I just wanted to, to get a, get a show the, the magnitude of this, that uh, even in 2008, when there's... Uh, you know, a lot happened and a lot, a lot of uh, uncertainty in the market, um, a lot less driving in 2008 and shortly after 2008 because of uh, unemployment and uh, reducing expenses and things that businesses had to do. Uh, but this uh, crude oil index of the ETF uh, volatility index uh, is basically what the, the spread of the prices. So a lot of times you'll see uh, that these are spiking, but they're going up and down. It doesn't happen in oil so much, but it does happen in other other stock uh, and options on stocks and things. Um, that these are go that the spread is uh, sort of evened out because there's a lot of speculation that things will go up, and there's a lot of speculation that things will go down. So if there's a lot of speculation things will go up, and a lot of equal speculation that will go down, uh, then you'll get a flat curve here because it, it balances itself out, cancels itself out. Here, all of this volatility is in one direction. It's all down. Basically, all <laughs> you know, uh, people uh, speculating that the price is going to drop, uh, which is also extremely rare to, to see in finance. A little more common in oil, though. Uh, and then here is crude oil production. So you know, crude oil production has uh, just dropped off because uh, there's nowhere to sell it. And this is uh, pipeline petroleum movement. So um, you think about the oil supply chain, it comes in on tankers, um, it gets uh, either refined locally in a port, a city like Long Beach or, or uh, around Houston and other places. Um, uh, but then a lot of it's piped around uh, so that it can be used locally. And uh, that uh, dropped off significantly as well. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, 
seeing the new numbers when they come out. And I'm not sure if anyone saw this, but this was off the coast of uh, Long Beach, uh, right around that, that April 20th time frame. And this was uh, dozens of oil tankers out there. And you could see these off of the coast. Uh, I, I didn't see it myself, but I think that would have been just amazing to see uh, looking out of them. Long Beach to see all these oil tankers anchored out there. Uh, currently here in San Diego, there's a couple of cruise ships that are anchored out. Uh, you can't see them unless you're south of Point Loma, because Point Loma blocks them. But if you go to uh, Coronado and drive across the bridge, you can see these giant uh, cruise ships just hanging right off the coast and some other container ships and other things at times as well. Because basically they keep them in uh, cold storage. Uh, or sorry, a warm, warm storage or hot storage uh, where they have to keep the engines running and things. It actually takes quite a bit to shut one of these machines down. Um, you have to clear out all the fuel lines and all this kind of stuff. So um, they keep them running. They keep a crew on the ships uh, to keep everything running. And uh, they basically live out there. And you can see them out there now if you go down to Coronado. No, not the oil tankers, the, uh, the cruise ships and some other ships. So looking at autos, um, this is really interesting uh, chart. Here we have uh, domestic auto production and up here we have auto inventories. And we actually had quite a bit of buildup of inventory here in the between 2014 and 2017 or so. Um, the production wasn't particularly ramping up um, and sales were down. So I'm not sure why, why there was so much inventory there. Uh, but that's interesting. And then it started to come down pretty significantly. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the sales obviously dropped off. The production dropped off as well, uh, which is somewhat uh, recovered, at least as of June 1st. These are monthly numbers. Um, and inventories are, are down low right now. Um, the other thing is that the, the loan rates are low. Uh, so this is 5.14% on a five-year loan. Uh, but I've seen a lot of commercials where companies are offering uh, interest-free sales on vehicles. Um, so there are some, some opportunities if you need to buy a vehicle out there. Uh, not only can you probably get a 0% interest rate, but even if you can't get a 0% interest rate, uh, your bank will do almost anything to, to uh, loan somebody money that'll pay back a few percent on an auto loan, which, which pays back more on more than other loans. Uh, vehicle miles traveled, so this is non-seasonal, so you can see the spikes here. February is always the slow year, or the slow month. Um, and then in July, uh, 300 billion miles traveled, just in the U.S. alone, uh, just in the month of July. And that, like everything else, fell off a cliff down to 168 billion, uh, and that's uh, recovered, at least as of, I think this is May. Uh, correspondingly, uh, a couple of factors. One, people are driving less, uh, and which uh, d drops demand. And then, of course, the, uh, the glut of supply. So, um, let's see. If someone from Tableau is listening, um, I wanted to mention that you have, to, you have to show the title in order to click this little highlight thing. <clears throat> but if you hide the title, which I like to do, then you don't get it. Okay, so uh, this is just looking at New York versus U.S. Gulf Coast versus L.A., which has a little bit special type of gasoline. Um, but you can see that prices have dropped off quite a bit, um, and they're also recovering um, pretty much around the board. Um, I believe these prices here, this is listed at about $1.40 per gallon. So you're not gonna get that at the pump. I think these are, these are probably wholesale prices that don't include uh, federal and state taxes and other things that, they, uh, that increases the price of gasoline uh, margin and all that. So this is uh, loan delinquencies. I have quarterly data up through January. Um, the, the second quarter hasn't come up yet hasn't come out yet, um, but 
uh, I would expect that we're going to see some spikes on all of these numbers. So this is looking at the delinquency rates on different types of loans. Here's credit cards. Uh, these are mortgages here. Uh, commercial real estate in particular is almost certainly going to be devastated. And uh, the Fed is, uh, is taking some action to, to help out with this. <clears throat> Looking at jobs, uh, these are the number of employees by sector. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, looking at, um, th these are monthly numbers. So in February uh, is the, February 1st, the, the month of February is the baseline for all of these numbers. And this percentage here is uh, the percent increase or decrease. So building material and garden supply stores have actually added 3% uh, to their employee, total employee count. Um, which is, uh, let's see units on this, thousands, so 1.34 million people work in that sector. Uh, food and beverage, beverage stores have added 1%. Uh, a few are sideways, but by far most of them are down a lot. Um, so this is the nominal value, it went from 2125 to 2021, 5% loss. And the hardest hit ones are gonna be motion picture and sound recording industries, which is down 53%. And uh, performing arts and spectator sports is down 47%. Uh, we know the story clothing, all the retail stores are, <clears throat> if not closed, uh, mostly empty. And uh, I'll take this opportunity to ask if anyone out there knows how to do something in Tableau that I cannot figure out how to do. Um, so I do know how to sort this by a table calc. So my table calc here is percent change versus February 1st. And if you throw that out there and make it discrete, you can move it to the front and Tableau will automatically sort uh, ascending, in this case, the minus 62% um, will automatically sort these ascending and you can multiply that by minus one to flip that if you'd like. Uh, but you can see that I no longer have the series uh, because I want a separate measure, measure date, uh, but there's only one value of 62%, so everything else gets filtered out. So um, if anyone knows how to do that, where you can fill, where you can sort by table calc and also keep a series, uh, also display a series, um, then please let me know. So some of the major uh, Federal Reserve actions that were taken was, first of all, they dropped all the, the interbank loan lending rates uh, so down to 0.25%. Yeah, so they're not actually zero, uh, but 0.25%, so minimize that. A um, couple days later, uh, they basically made commercial loans available that were backed up or collateralized with commercial paper, municipal bonds, and a bunch of equity types. Um, which are frankly debt that's going to go unpaid in a lot of cases, not the equities, but uh, commercial paper uh, for, for companies that had to shut down. So commercial paper are short-term business loans. Um, every major company uh, issues commercial paper, including Amazon and other countries that are, uh, are companies that are uh, still doing well. And it's just a way that they manage cash flow. Uh, if you need $70 million to pay for some piece of equipment, um, then you can uh, you can basically borrow that money short term um, and then uh, make make that and have that available. So basically, this is the Fed buying again bad assets uh, so that uh, the banks can get those off of their books, and they're not all, not all going to go under uh, so that they can continue to loan out money. There were also some uh, some adjustments made um, to loosen up uh, cash flow uh, and cash liquidity for uh, a lot of countries who were seeing a lot of uh, runs to to get to withdraw U.S. dollars. Um, so you can imagine the the Federal Reserve literally manages the the flow of 
of hard currency, cash and coins, or uh, currency and coins uh, for the entire world. So they're constantly shipping out real money from their bank vaults to banks, bank vaults around the world. And a lot of these things are just digital transactions. You don't really actually need the hard money. So a lot of the borrowing is just money, just digits going uh, up and down. Uh, but in but there's still a tremendous amount of actual real paper money and real coins uh, that have to be sh shipped constantly around the world uh, so that banks can um, have the, the cash that they need to fill up their ATM machines. Um, and there's a well-known cycle for these, uh, uh, for how cash moves. Uh, cash moves biggest on weekends and uh, certain holidays. Uh, and, you know, there's a, long-standing system in place and understanding of how these, uh, of how the money needs to move around uh, in order to provide uh, that cash for uh, distribution. Uh, but this is obviously an emergency, so they had to jump in and, uh, and make some adjustments for that, uh, inc including increasing the frequency. They used to just do these cash swaps on a weekly basis, and uh, now they're doing them on a daily basis. Uh, and one of the biggest uh, changes is that normally, uh, since 2008, banks have to have a certain amount of uh, actual cash, uh, either in the form of currency or gold uh, or other um, secured assets deposited at the Federal Reserve banks. So this is so that the banks can have a certain amount of soundness uh, and, and if they have to draw on those reserves uh, in order to uh, to hand out money because there's a run on the bank or because they have bad loans that aren't getting paid back or whatever, they can draw on those cash reserves. Um, and on March 26, the Fed completely eliminated all the re reserve requirements entirely for all commercial banks. So again, the point here is they're trying to get people to not store money in the bank, uh, to make that money available in the, in the world for people and to uh, loan it out uh, with very little credit spreads. They also removed the six per month limit on commercial bank withdrawals. So if you have a, uh, I, I think this applies to savings and checking accounts, and maybe just savings accounts. Uh, but if, if you need money to, to survive, you can pull money out more than six times per month. So looking at the, the Federal Reserve uh, uh, depository requirements, uh, so looking at the sum here, uh, $215 billion was, was how much was required to be in the banks. And like I said, they dropped that down to zero instantly. So now no more money is required. Commercial banks are not required to store money at the Federal Reserve any longer. <clears throat> and in fact, um, that led to some... Uh, to some withdrawals clearly here as well, because you can see here the total reserves deposited was $3 trillion, $3.2 trillion, and now it's uh, $2.6 trillion. So $600 billion has been uh, removed from those Federal Reserve banks and distributed to the commercial banks. Um, interest rate on required reserves. So this is how much interest the Federal Reserve pays these commercial banks to store money because uh, obviously if they're gonna require you to store money, you don't wanna just lose all of the opportunity cost and uh, any interest on that. So they, they do uh, charge interest here or they do pay interest on these. So for the longest time after 2008, it was down to 0.25% because they're encouraging uh, banks to keep money out into the world and not to store it in the vaults, uh, in the Federal Reserve vault any more than they have to. Um, and they had started to ramp that up because like I said earlier, they're trying to put the brakes on the economy. They're actually trying to make an, uh, give an incentive for, company, uh, for banks, to commercial banks to store their money in the Federal Reserve vaults. And <clears throat> those rates r rose to 2.4%. And they had started to uh, lower those rates um, over the last year or so. Uh, but then again, they just dropped them down to 0.1% is what that current interest rate on required reserves is. So banks are not going to store any more money than they have to, uh, but they're still storing quite a bit of money uh, in total reserves.
So besides regular required reserves, banks can also store excess reserves and they get the same interest rate uh, roughly on, on uh, storing those excess reserves. So those would just be amounts that are beyond the required reserve limits. And it, it shows a similar pattern where that was ramping up quite a bit um, early COVID times. Uh, and now they've started to, uh, banks have started to pull out some money there. So looking at the, the federal funds and the discount rate, this is, uh, this is the, the rate that, uh, that the Federal Reserve loans uh, money to banks is the, is the federal funds rate. Um, or sorry, the federal funds rate is the rate at which banks loan their excess reserves uh, to each other. So again, it's just a cash flow game. Uh, sometimes banks need a lot of cash at one time for certain peer purpose. Maybe they're going to make an investment in something, uh, loan money out to somebody for a $100 million commercial real estate deal or something like that. Um, so uh, again, you could see that in uh, these, these are the hyperinflationary times of the uh, late 70s, early 80s, when uh, that rate was 18.9%. And that's, that's the basis of all lending. So <laughs> mortgage rates were, were also that high as well, if you can imagine. Instead of paying 4%, you're paying 19%. So looking at the, the total amount of federal debt, so I only have numbers up to Q1 right now, so this is gonna, gonna spike tremendously, uh, but this is 20 million million, so $20 trillion uh, in the current uh, federal total debt held by the public. <clears throat> and as a percent of GDP, that's, uh, that's above 100% now. So uh, basically the GDP is how much uh, production in a single year. And uh, basically we, the United States could uh, work for a year and pay off all the debt and not spend any of that production on anything else uh, and, and be able to pay down the debt in a little bit over a year. Uh, so that's gonna spike up and uh, that, that's gonna be a higher higher percentage of GDP, especially because the denominator GDP itself is gonna be lower. So it's gonna be higher debt, lower GDP. So much higher ratio. I'm not sure when that number comes out, but I'm looking forward to that Q2 number. Uh, this is the percent of debt held uh, by foreign and international in investors. And this uh, currently stood at 32% uh, in Q1. The amount of currency in circulation. So another thing that the, the Federal Reserve does is uh, to, to, in, to, to promote spending and in the real world is to print more money and make that money av available uh, with, with low interest rates. Um, so you can see that there has been quite a spike in the amount of currency in circulation <clears throat> which now stands at two million million, so two trillion dollars in. This is actual currency, meaning bills and, uh, and coins, and I think it might include gold or something too, uh, gold coins, things like that. <clears throat> this is the volume of uh, each denomination. So uh, currently there are fourteen point two billion hundred dollar bills out there and 12.7 billion $1 bills out there. And they're gonna be printing a lot more of these. Uh, this is the value. So the value of $100 bills in circulation is $1.4 trillion worldwide. And the Federal Reserve just ordered additional currency for their 2020 uh, printing year. So their 2020 print order, uh, you can see here that they're gonna pr print a little bit less, a little bit fewer fives, same number of tens, another 400,000 $20 bills, another 150,000 or so $50 bills, and another uh, 250,000 $100 bills, um, all which intend to be uh, distributed to uh, banks at very low interest rates so that that money can get out to the people and hopefully we can uh, 
see more spending out in the real world. This is the volume of gold at the various uh, depositories and, uh, and the mints in the US. Uh, so this is Fort Knox up here, 147 million troy ounces are stored there. And uh, gold coins are stored uh, mostly in the New York vault at the Federal Reserve Bank, 73,000 troy ounces in gold coins. Now, what's interesting is on the books, uh, the U.S. Treasury values its gold at $42.22 an ounce. If you've been paying attention to the price of gold, uh, it's over $2,000 per ounce. So the book value was uh, about $6 billion. The, the book value is about $6 billion for the Fort Knox gold. Uh, but the real market value is over $300 billion for that gold. These are coins, uh, coin production. So uh, looking at uh, each of the denominations, you can see that they've been pr printing significantly fewer coins over the last few years, um, which makes sense because we just don't use them quite as often. Although currently there is a coin shortage. Um, and the reason is because coins are usually uh, transferred uh, within the population among businesses, mostly retail, um, you know, even things like parking meters. Uh, you know, there's obviously some industries that use a lot more coins than others, uh, laundromats and things like that. Um, but it has, uh, there's plenty of coins out there, but they're just not moving. And uh, therefore there are shortages showing up in, in certain areas. So the U.S. Mint is uh, asking people to return their coins to the banks uh, so that they can be put back into circulation. Uh, this is just an, an interesting side note. Not it doesn't really have anything to do with the current economy, but um, the uh, U.S. Mint ordered uh, presidential coins here. Uh, it's a series of coins. So these are you know, various one-dollar coins. But in particular, they started ordering uh, 300 million uh, $1 coins and they delivered them to the Federal Reserve banks who stored them in the vaults. <clears throat> they, the, the Federal Reserve banks still have over a billion $1 coins in their vaults. I know these coins are not worth anywhere near a million dollars, uh, near a dollar, uh, even $1 in metal, metal value. These are not real gold. For instance, the Sacagawea is not real gold. Um, but uh, they're, they're, they're valued by collectors. So the market value of a billion $1 coins is actually uh, more than one, more than $1 billion. Uh, so they, they move those to the Federal Reserve banks and then the Federal Reserve actually moves them in and out of commercial banks. Um, I'm not sure why they do this compared to bills. Uh, it seems like it would be cheaper to move bills, but um, they actually use that they, they use those $1 coins. Um, uh, they take them out of circulation and they put them into circulation uh, from bank to bank. Um, and that's actually dropped off. So that used to be a lot more common, uh, but now they don't do that quite as much. So looking at the, the price of gold, the price of gold has skyrocketed since uh, COVID. Um, it was already doing uh, pretty well. It was uh, holding and rising even uh, above its above the levels that it was holding. Um, hadn't quite reached its peak uh, of 2011, uh, but since then it has blown through that. And now, uh, as of yesterday, it was $2,048 per ounce. I don't know why I had that one on there twice. Uh, and then looking at the, the 
gold mining and production uh, hasn't really been uh, significantly affected, uh, but it is considerably lower than it used to be. And I imagine that's going to ramp up quite a bit now that gold has uh, become so much more valuable. So looking at inflation, one of the big questions out there right now is, is, is there going to be hyperinflation because they're printing so much money? Um, and uh, this is a, a real balancing act. There are right now tremendous inflationary pressures, but there are also tremendous deflationary pressures. So in the short term, people are not worried about inflation, but in the longer term, they are. And some of the things that's that showing is the dollar is weakening right now, gold price is soaring. Um, the, you know, some of the, the factors are that, like I mentioned, the Fed is basically putting more and more money into circulation and reducing credit, uh, recruits, reducing credit rates so that um, people can spend that money. So they're trying to put as much money out there as possible and make it as easy to, to borrow and therefore spend. Uh, but because of demand with uh, low employment, uh, the less spending and the reduced cost of labor is keeping prices down. Um, and of course, consumers and businesses are reducing expenses. Uh, and a lot of people are delaying larger purchases, even if they have the money, uh, for instance, real estate. So looking at the consumer price index, which is uh, basically a, a representative basket of goods, uh, and they take the prices and uh, look to see are those prices uh, increasing or decreasing. And um, there was a reduction, <clears throat> and it's uh, come up a little bit. Uh, this is overall, uh, so includes, I believe this includes even uh, energy and, and housing and things like that. Uh, but if you look at, um, <clears throat> Flexible goods are goods that uh, tend to fluctuate a lot uh, in price, and sticky goods are goods that, that tend to uh, keep their prices um, even when there's a lot of other factors in play. And that has mostly to do with the fact that certain industries take uh, more money to ramp up supply, and uh, they're just they don't respond quite as much to uh, to, to fast trends. But even those sticky priced goods fell quite a bit, um, but they've recovered to normal levels for the most part, uh, as have uh, flexible goods prices. Uh, one thing that is up a lot is uh, the price of meat. So you can see here, there's uh, quite a bit of spike here uh, in almost every category, uh, steaks, pork chops, ham, uh, bacon, but it's not as high as other prices. So it's uh, still still uh, not pr uh, pr uh, contributing a ton to inflation at this point. <clears throat> Some food staples like uh, butter, uh, eggs, sugar, beans, a lot of those prices are actually down. Uh, coffee's up a little bit uh, and bread's up a little bit, but for the most part, these uh, these commodity or these uh, yeah, consumer goods prices are down right now uh, and, and balancing out some of the increases in other areas. <clears throat> Fruits and vegetables not showing much change at this point either. And alcohol, <laughs> tiny little spike in vodka price. <laughs> not sure people are using that as a hand sanitizer or drinking it, but um, it's also not as high as other things. and. Uh, Wine, luckily, is down a little bit. So looking at uh, the prices of energy, uh, we've got natural gas, uh, fuel oil, kerosene, propane, and, and diesel. Uh, everything's down uh, because of the demand side. Looking at foreign exchange rates, uh, this is the Euro and the Canadian dollar. And you can see here that, um, and these are actually inverse. So this one is how many Canadian dollars to a US dollar, and this one's how many US dollars to a Euro. So um, when one goes up, the other one actually, uh, <clears throat> when one goes up, it means it's stronger. When the other one goes down, it means it's stronger. Um, so right now you can see that there was a, a, some strength in the US dollar against the 
the Canadian dollar, you could get 1.4 Canadian dollars right after COVID hit. It was 1.3 before, uh, but that's come down a little bit. The dollar is losing some strength and it's back to about the levels that it was. And you see the same thing with the Euro. Um, uh, and now you can get $1.17 for one Euro, um, which is up from about $1.10. So not, not a whole lot of change there, but it is starting to trend up here, meaning dollar weakness. The Japanese yen hasn't changed much. It's been extremely stable. Uh, and didn't change a whole lot during COVID. Um, you can see from Mexico, uh, peso, Mexican peso, um, the dollar has gained, gained strength against the Mexican peso, and that's coming down a little bit, um, but it's still on an upward trend in the Brazilian real as well. <clears throat> so looking at um, the dollar index, so this is looking at across all currencies, basically um, the strength of the dollar against everything um, and it was going up uh, quite a bit until COVID and then even a spike until, uh, at COVID, but then um, it's, it's taking a downward trend now as the dollar is losing some, uh, losing some strength here. And you can trade for an exchange too. So um, there's almost no barrier to, to get into the trading of Forex. So uh, if you think that these trends are gonna go one way or other, you can actually invest that way. Looking at treasury bills, which are short-term uh, debt offered by the U.S. government, issued by the U.S. government, and the rates are just nothing right now uh, you know, on new, new issuances as well as secondary markets. So uh, basically these uh, short-term interest rates are super low <clears throat> and um, there's just you know, there it's a it's a not much. It's not going to pay back much. So I would expect the inflows into these as well to be uh, reduced. I don't have those numbers, but uh, bond rates. Uh, looking at the thirty-year yield, uh, it's paying one point one percent. Back in the late seventies, early eighties, it was paying fifteen percent for a thirty-year bond, um, and those bond rates are. Uh, at this point now for the three year, it's 0.1%. And for the 30 year, it's 1.1%. So um, you usually get a bigger spread here when there's uh, optimism uh, as people think that they're gonna, uh, that the government will be able to pay these back in 30 years. Uh, this is the treasury inflation protected securities. So these are, uh, uh, there's definitely money flowing into these right now. The, the amount that they return uh, is, is pegged to the, infl the inflation rate. So um, yeah, there's an expectation that inflation is going to increase, which there is over the long term. Um, then these become more, uh, more valuable. And uh, right now they, they're sold at a, one a negative 1% 1 yield because people think that they're gonna, that inflation is gonna give you back more than 1% and that that's gonna pay off in the long run. I don't know what the break even for that is, but over the course of 30 years, people are speculating that it's gonna be a lot more than 1% inflation. <clears throat> Looking at CD rates, uh, which are also paying almost nothing now, um, you can see here, just looking at the trend, lower interest rates here were designed to promote inflation and, and promote employment after the, uh, uh, the 2008 housing bubble uh, and those interest rates were low. And then we started to rise. We also saw this in the federal funds rate because these are tied. Uh, so this was basically to prevent the next bu bubble combat, to combat inflation. And um, those rates uh, just dropped off a cliff also, uh, COVID time here. So no reason to buy a CD and store your money in the bank at 0.1% uh, or 0.5%. Banks would rather you have, uh, or the, the government would rather you keep that money and, and spend it out in the real world to promote the economy. Looking at stock uh, exchanges, uh, the NASDAQ has been on a steady increase, uh, S&P also. You can see there's quite a V-shaped recovery here in the stock exchanges. Um, NASDAQ has blown past pre-COVID numbers. Uh, S&P, I have data up to 8.3. It actually, I think yesterday 
or the day before it, uh, it actually surpassed pre-COVID. So this is actually a little bit higher now. Um, and <clears throat> you can see here, just looking at, uh, this is when, uh, this is the date basically, uh, I called it the world COVID date 214, um, when it became obvious that this was, was spreading rapidly uh, in China and other parts of the world. Um, and uh, this is the US day, which I'm just calling 3-1. Um, and you can see that uh, the markets were already reacting to the spread, but then when it hit the US, they obviously react even more. Uh, and then you can see those gains being being recovered since then. Amazon. Amazon is a company that's been able to leverage their uh, efficiency and their ability to scale. And they have basically kept up with, with uh, increased demand for delivery since people aren't going to store to buy to the store to buy things. <clears throat> and uh, they have benefited quite a bit. So like everything, they, they dropped quite a bit uh, right when everything started happening, but uh, they have recovered uh, tremendously since then and now uh, over $3,000 a share. So why is the stock market not crashing? I think this is something a lot of people are asking. Um, and the, the simple answer is there's just no other competition uh, among other investment vehicles. It's, um, it's also very liquid. So um, one of the strategies that people are taking right now is uh, be either in cash or be prepared to get the cash, have a, have a path to cash, and then put that cash to use when the time is right, uh, whether that's buying real estate after it drops or buying those stocks back at lower prices. Um, so people are keeping their money in stock uh, because it's easy, to, it's easy to convert to cash. Um, however, those crashes do occur sharply and deeply. So there is considerable risk. Uh, even though they're easy to convert to cash, you still uh, could, could lose quite a bit in there. Um, and uh, again, just, despite credit being cheap, uh, there's just not a whole lot of demand in the economy right now. So uh, expanding businesses and starting new businesses are, are suffering. Uh, and quantitative easing plays a role as well uh, by just backstopping distressed loans. Uh, and then there's also companies like consumer goods, Amazon, Walmart, healthcare uh, that are gonna maintain their high earnings. Uh, the stock markets are, are the indexes, S&P and NASDAQ in particular, are also heavily weighted uh, with these giant companies. So the FANG stocks, which is Facebook, Apple, Amazon, uh, Netflix, and Google, they make up 20% of the S&P alone. So if they're doing well, the S&P is doing well. Um, and also there's a, a number of programs that are just buy stock programmatically, uh, which supports demand. Cryptocurrencies uh, are on the rise. Uh, this is also an inflationary sign uh, relative to the dollar. Uh, they all dropped off a little bit, but they're all recovering quite nicely. Uh, Bitcoin, I think is the most popular one. Um, and it is uh, almost at uh, the uh, resistance levels from June last year, so about a year ago. <clears throat> not quite as high as uh, it was at the peak, uh, but definitely heading that way. And if you're a, a trader that looks at technicals, um, anytime you get past this support level, uh, typically the next step is one of these, is the resistance level is gonna be at one of these. So there could be an opportunity here. Uh, I have some real estate data I'm gonna, to skip that to San Diego stuff. Uh, I will look at uh, the firearms purchases. So this is the, the purchases of firearms, uh, 2.6 million in July, uh, and every single state saw an increase in, in fire, a massive increase in firearms purchases. Uh, obviously this is because of some of the uh, social unrest, not, not just from COVID, um, but I think uh, in, some, in some sense it's all related. <clears throat> Uh, and then just to, 
to finish on a, a happy note, uh, ice cream production is still up. So he still, still can get some ice cream and, and try to relax and enjoy and forget about the world for a little bit. Um, and uh, the price is not, not uh, particularly high now either, a little bit up, but uh, for the most part, um, you can still get your, just get your ice cream out there. And hopefully that takes the sting off a little bit. And that's all I got for today. I think I finished right at the perfect time. Wow, Matt, do you have any stats on ice cream demand? <laughs> um, uh, it's down. I, I think Summer time's the big time. And that you need to have a, you know, you need to be on the Bloomberg uh, channel. Uh, there are a couple questions. Thank you. And of course, this is your program, but there are a couple questions I thought I would, you know, re up for you. Um, Charles yeah. asked about a little bit about the technical workflow and, you know, connecting to the, uh, the various APIs. You know, do, can you do that directly from Tableau Public? Is, is the question. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so obviously you would start with Tableau Desktop to, to create that connection before you publish it up there. Um, I don't know if you can call APIs directly from Tableau as a data source directly, or if you can do that with an extension or something. I just, unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. Um, for me though, I, I pulled it through the API through another a little tool that I developed um, and I just have it available for as a data source in Tableau, but it's not, I'm not calling the API directly in real time here. Okay, couple of, thank you. Uh, a couple other technical questions. Uh, how did you get the YouTube video to play without errors? That's a good question. I'm not sure if, uh, if Tableau is relying on a browser that's installed, uh, like a, like because I have edge running or something uh, that it works, but I just pasted the URL here. Yeah. Nothing special. Okay, great. Keep it simple. And then um, um, another question, a little more detailed uh, regarding the sort by table calculation, would it work to do exactly what you did, but first create a second instance of the calculation? Mm -hmm. uh, that's from anonymous. Good question. And uh, try to remember, I think that was the wages or the jobs one. Uh, yeah, so the, the issue is in order to use it, in order to take advantage of this little trick of, of having Tableau sort a dimension automatically by putting it up front here, you have to have it as a discrete dimension. So that means that you're going to get a point for every minus 62 percent, every minus 58 percent, minus 56. So you can see the number of marks here and the number of rows. It went from something to 268. It was at 90. So I, here I have 90 rows because I have a lot of data points across the series here. But when you go to put that table calc as a discrete dimension, now it's giving you a point for every percent change, including every point, you know, from, from left to right here. So now you have a lot more points, but you've only got one point on each line and you don't get that series from this, this continuous measure across the top. Uh, and it's, this is just completely, all I needed this is for sorting purposes. Um, you know, obviously I could, I've already got this line displayed here or this point displayed on the chart uh, and I have it showing up in the right place, uh, but I wanted to take advantage of that sort. And I actually just manually sorted this. My solution was just manually sort 90 of these, or I guess in this case now it's uh, 45. Yeah, 45, so I just sorted these manually, which took about five minutes. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't think that creating a second instance is going to help because it would also be, it would have to be discrete. In order to use it for the sorting, you have to have it first here. And, and a, a technique people use, if they want to use an index like that for sorting, you would usually hide it because you don't want that to show. So you make that discrete, put it up front, and then say, okay, I don't want to show that, but the sorting is still in place. So you're still getting the sorting benefit, but you don't have to show it, especially if you multiply that by minus one. Uh, you don't want to show negative numbers up there. Um, 
so yeah, I don't think that uh, duplicating it is it's going to solve the problem in this case. Uh, so I, I see the question about um, currency printing. Is that hyperinflation or high inflation? The, the currency printing itself is not inflation in itself. I mean, this is just literally more money, you know, more bills and, and coins out in, in the world. Um, a lot of time, you know, they're, they're in circulation because they're not in vaults. So the banks are putting them out there so that people can use them to make it spend. They're trying to make fast, easy money. Right? They're trying to, to promote inflation now because we have such deflationary pressures. Um, so that in itself is not, but basically, uh, you know, inflation is more money facing fewer products and, um, that's why more money in print is, uh, is a factor in inflation. So this is definitely one reason why people see hyperinflation on the horizon. Cool. Any other questions? Fantastic. Okay. So I see, uh, I think, I think you can sort on the units pill by selecting the table count from the options. So Matt, there've been a couple other questions that have been floating around about the LinkedIn group that you mentioned, you know, what, like, how do people find it? join it? Does it have a name? And uh, uh, you might want to talk about that as well. Uh, the, and this has been a great um, session, especially for audience participation. And there's some questions in chat, uh, comments about LinkedIn and following up, finding out about job opportunities, things like that. Yeah. Um, so the uh, on LinkedIn, there are uh, LinkedIn groups. And we have a San Diego Tableau user group uh, where we post, uh, where I post any job op openings that I hear about. Uh, anyone is free to post in there. Uh, so you can take, uh, take advantage of that. And uh, we will post uh, announcements for future meetings as well as material from meetings, including this one. Um, I can't publish this whole workbook because there's some, uh, because of some of the limitations on the FRED uh, data usage terms, but um, I can uh, definitely talk about any techniques or anything that I used here. Great, thank you. And I posted the uh, the LinkedIn URL to our chat for this group. Perfect. Awesome, thanks everyone. Thank you, Matt. Thanks everybody. Yeah, we'll let you know about the, the next meeting. Um, if anyone's interested in presenting at the next meeting or eventually hosting an in-person meeting uh, at your company, uh, definitely let me know about that. Uh, we, we try to move the meeting around different parts of San Diego if possible to give everyone an opportunity to, to attend. Um, and uh, hopefully we can uh, get back to, to real in-person meetings at some point soon. All right, Matt. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thanks, everyone. Do this Take again. care. Thank you. Bye-bye.